beloved people of God. It is good to worship with you. I'm Holly Morrison, the pastor of Phippsburg Congregational Church, United Church of Christ. And this broadcast marks one full year of worshiping God and caring for each other through the COVID pandemic. One full year of isolation, of being unable to hug or touch or sing together. One year of feeling like the season of Lent is stuck on an endless loop. Yet we have made it this far. By faith and providence and perhaps some measure of New England obstinance, this pandemic Lent is not over, yet vaccine distribution has begun, and we are making plans for a real in-person sunrise service on Easter. So now, honoring both your hope and your weariness, take a deep breath. Yes, praise God, praise God, we have come this far. Yes, in the name of Jesus Christ, we will keep going. Yes, with the help of the Holy Spirit and the gentle comfort of music, let us once again share this sacred time and space and enter together into worship. Please join me for our call to worship. Give thanks for God's steadfast love endures forever. Love that gathers us in from east and west, north and south. Love for the sin sick, the screw up, the cringe worthy. Love for the wasting ones at the gates of death. Love hears, love reaches out. Love still loves no matter what. Steadfast love, God's love, offer thanks, tell the story, sing out.
please join in our gathering prayer and the Lord's Prayer. We have come this far, O God, and for what? Still the vulnerable die while others taunt and make a show of burning masks? Still the humble are underpaid? Still the peaceful are outgunned? Still we weep for loved ones we cannot yet touch? Still we long to raise harmonies that cause no risk of death? We have come this far, O God, and you've come too, to meet us in wilderness or under cover of night, to walk with us toward Jerusalem. And so we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. A reading from the Hebrew Scriptures, the Book of Numbers, 21, verses 4 through 9. The Hebrew people challenged Moses several times during their years in the wilderness, on the way to the Promised Land. This passage describes one of those times. The people's behavior is already poisonous long before any snakes arrive on the scene. They are ungrateful, arrogant, full of accusations and blame. In order to be freed from poison, God says they have to look at a lifted staff with a bronze serpent. Folks in addiction recovery might recognize this metaphoric truth. You have to face the source of the venom in order to start healing. By the way, the Hebrews weren't the only ones to come up with the snake on a pole thing. A Greek version, version called the Rod of Asclepius was used as a symbol for healing as early as the first century of the Common Era. A two-snake version, called the Cadacious, is now a widely recognized symbol of medicine. Reading from the fourth verse to the ninth verse of chapter 21. From Mount Hor they set out by the way to the Red Sea, to go around the land of Edom, but the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it upon a pole. And whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live.
That's my favorite story in the whole Bible. Do you think I'd look good in bronze? Hmm? On a stick? So fancy. People would hold me up, and everyone would say, Ooh, yay! It's a steak on a stick! Hmm. Unless they mistake me for a hot dog. Oh, no. Stay away from that campfire. Trust me, I taste terrible. Nothing like chicken. Nothing at all. There aren't very many nice snake stories in the Bible. In the book of Genesis, there's that story about the big garden where the first people live and everybody gets so mad at the snake. Not fair. There was the fruit and God told them not to touch it. And all the snake said was, hmm, think about it. That, sna that fruit looks pretty good. And the people ate the fruit, but the snake didn't. Why do they keep getting mad at the snake? Well, anyway, today's story comes from the book of Numbers, which is funny because the book is really full of letters instead. Anyway, any everybody's out in the wilderness and they're so whiny. Moses, we don't like the food. Moses, we're thirsty. Moses, are we there yet? Moses, you're stupid. God's stupid. The wilderness is stupid. Moses, I'm so tired of this stupid wilderness. I think I'm going to die. Oh, and this is my favorite part. Are you ready? God gets so sick of their whining. She calls up her friends, the snakes, and says, snakes, help me out. And then the snakes start biting everybody until they say they're sorry. And this is my other favorite part. Moses makes a fancy stick with a gorgeous bronze snake on it. And everybody who looks at it says, Ooh, that's the prettiest thing I've ever seen as long as I live. That's not it. Sorry, what? Everyone who looked at it would live. Right, close enough. Ooh, that snake's so beautiful. I feel like living again. Hmm. Why did I agree to let you do this? Because I'm a beautiful snake and God loves me. That's why. Now, kids, later this week on March 17th, it will be St. Patrick's Day. St. Patrick lived in Ireland hundreds of years ago, and he taught lots of people about Jesus. Some say he also drove all the snakes out of Ireland, but don't you believe it? Ireland never had any snakes to begin with. Poor country. I wouldn't want to live there either. Say a prayer. Sorry, what? Say a prayer. Oh, all right. Will you pray with me? God, thank you for making snakes and for making us so beautiful. Oh, thank you for people too, especially people who like snakes. Amen. I invite you to join now in the prayers of our community. We know, dear God, that you are with us in all that we endure. 
be with those who start each day in pain of mind, body, or spirit, especially those struggling with addiction or abuse. Wrap your wings of comfort around Vicky as she grieves the death of her sister, Alex. And be with Helene as she mourns for her dear canine companion, Chance. Watch over Joni, Sue, and Sylvia as they continue their recoveries at home. We pray this day for people who are unsure how to hold on, exhausted parents and caregivers, teens and children and elders starving for a non-virtual gathering and a real human touch. We pray for the ones who put on their masks and go about their work even as they are weeping or wailing underneath or treading the edge of burnout. And we pray for more than our human concerns. We pray for the silver smelt and alewives and salmon struggling to survive among dammed rivers and warming seas. We pray for all the creatures who breathed and moved easier when humans were forced to remain in place. God of all creation, as vaccines restore our freedom to move, keep us mindful of our impact on the rest of all of your creation. O oh Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And hear too the hope and joy that rises in our hearts this day. We celebrate the birth of little Georgie, Dottie Swanson's great grandson. We give thanks for our second online concert of the year, another evening of uplifting music. We celebrate the gifts of science and tremendous coordinated efforts of those producing, distributing, and administering vaccines. Help us to ensure that they are distributed in your vision of heavenly justice with full equity among all God's people. And I offer a special prayer of celebration this day for the compassion and generosity of this congregation. You have not only kept our faith community going through this very difficult year and contributed to many in need, you have also sustained my wife and I through her recent surgery and ongoing recovery with so many prayers and expressions of kindness. I am so thankful to serve among you. And we celebrate more birthdays this week, including Kira Wilson, Paula Benoit, Ellen Parker, Chipper Simpson, Sharon Bond, Peter Doran, and Ginger Garside. May each of you be blessed with the gift of knowing that you are a gift and a beloved child of God. And now we come with all that we are and all that we long for, offering these to the one who hears us even before we ask. Let us be together in silent prayer. Good Shepherd, thank you for walking with us through this valley of the shadow of death, through the suffering, the anxiety, loneliness, boredom, the longing for closeness and the longing for personal space, 
the confusion and fear, the impatience and hope, good days and bad. Forgive us our suspicions of each other, the ways this ordeal has made us more divided as a country and as a world. Help us bridge our differences and come together even as we are physically distant. Thank you for all the ways, large and small, that this ordeal has strengthened us as a community. The acts of kindness, the new ways of doing things, the support we've offered and received. Forgive us the iniquities this pandemic has exposed. Kindle in our hearts a new commitment to justice as we build and rebuild our community together. Keep us ever mindful of those most in need. We pray especially for those who have lost loved ones, lost jobs, lost hope. Let us be good company even from afar, good neighbors and good friends. We pray especially for those on the front lines of the pandemic, for all who are in harm's way. Gentle God, we ask that you continue to keep watch with those who work or watch or weep this day. Walk with those whose bodies are holding memories of sickness, of trauma, of pain, of confusion, of chaos, of isolation. Give your angels charge over the, those who still cannot sleep because of anxiety and grief. Tend the sick, give rest to the weary, bless the dying, soothe the suffering, comfort the afflicted, shield the joyous, all for your love's sake. God of life and hope, lift our spirits as we dare to look ahead, dare to hope and dream about the new world to come. Strengthen our efforts, deepen our wisdom so that we might hasten that day. And until that day, keep our eyes and hearts open to the signs of hope and life all around us. For new ways to connect with each other, we give you thanks and praise for the beautiful hope of being together again in person someday soon, lifting our voices in song, passing the peace, sharing cups of coffee, being able to hug one another again. For that day is surely coming. We give you thanks and praise. For the ways in which our eyes have been opened by this ordeal, for the ways in which our hearts have been broken and put back together differently, softer and more attuned to the needs of the most vulnerable, we give you thanks and praise. For all these things and more, gentle God, we give you thanks and praise in the name of Jesus, our crucified and risen Jesus. Amen. Our Gospel lesson comes from the Gospel according to John, chapter 3, verses 14 through 17. This passage includes one of the most well-known verses in Christian scripture, John 3:16. It is part of a long conversation between Jesus and a Pharisee named Nicodemus. Nicodemus, like Jesus, is a faithful Jew, well-versed in Scripture. He sneaks down the street to meet Jesus under cover of night, with the hope that this radical rabbi will help him answer some burning questions. Jesus quotes several scriptures in his replies, including the stories of Abraham and Isaac, and the story of Moses and the bronze serpent. Reading from verse 14 through 17. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that God gave God's only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. 
Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Please pray with me. Holy One, may the words of your witness be lifted up in our hearts and in all our meditations. Be with us as we walk with you the road to Jerusalem. Be with us as we join you in facing the cross. Guide our words, guide our actions as we respond to your good news. Amen. If you've driven the winding road to Midcoast Hospital, you've seen the signs. Some are professionally printed, but many are handmade, painted with craft store paints on whatever wood was at hand. They were made earnestly, months ago, with so much love to encourage and thank healthcare workers during the rise of the pandemic. Some of those signs are new, but some of those signs are showing signs of wear, just like us. Wood weathered and gray, colors faded and blurred, each of them hinting at what we've been through and what might be beyond. They are signposts along our own pandemic wilderness. It's been strange to drive past those signs these past few weeks to a building I can't go in. Years ago, I worked as a hospital chaplain and the rhythm of visits in and out of hospital rooms felt as familiar as my own home. Pandemic restrictions have been slightly relaxed, but I still had to wait outside for hours after my own wife's surgery. Restrictions carefully designed to keep us all safe from, each, from infection also kept us isolated from each other. As she endured surgery and several hours of fierce post-operative pain, the nurses, bless them, called with updates every couple of hours, and I hung on every word. Finally, they pronounced her ready and gave me permission to drive up to the entrance so they could bring her out and help load her into the car for the ride home. The next few days were another kind of wilderness, a wilderness many of you are all too familiar with, as we tried to manage pain and forced changes of routine demanded by her limited mobility. We had a community of love and prayer around us delicious home-cooked food from our church family and friends who stepped in to help with farm chores. But you know what the old song says, you've got to walk that lonesome valley. You've got to walk it by yourself. We still had to endure some things and make some hard choices on our own. When Nicodemus and Jesus met, urgently, under cover of darkness, they too were navigating a wilderness of pain. They were both clinging to a holy promise while trying to thread their way between the harsh judgments of their faith community and the brutal repression of the Roman regime. Nicodemus was a Pharisee part of a group committed to keeping Jewish practice and identity alive rather than blending in with the Greek and Roman cultures around them. It was an active group, even though their actions put them at constant risk of persecution. And Jesus was sympathetic to their cause, even when he didn't always agree with their methods. He and Nicodemus were both striving toward new life and surrounded by toxic systems and forces of death. Whether you're a caregiver 
or a soldier, a frontline worker in a pandemic or a spiritual fighter for justice, battle fatigue is real. And it has similar effects for all of these. Your stamina wears down, your resilience fades, and the accumulated trauma affects your ability to make decisions. Like the Hebrews yelling at God and each other in the wilderness, Nicodemus was beginning to wonder if there was any way out of this wilderness besides death. And then Jesus made the connection. Remember how Moses lifted up that snake on a pole in the wilderness? How he held up the symbol of all their venom, their poisonous attacks, and everyone who looked at it in the face began to heal and survived? In that same way, Jesus said to Nicodemus, the human one who embodies God's love would be hung up on a pole. And anyone brave enough to stop rebelling against that love, anyone brave enough to bear witness to our full human capacity for violence and betrayal, anyone willing to face the ultimate result of our rebellion in the death by crucifixion of an innocent man, bearing witness at that cross in honesty and humility? Our hearts might finally break open, pour out all the poison and the pain, and begin to heal. For this is the way God loves the world. God takes on a human form, to grow and learn and love among us, embodying divine compassion in a fragile vessel of bone and blood, troubled brain and sun-washed skin. God took a human form, even though God knew our cruelties and prejudices could lead us to lynch a child of God. And then, the Holy One draws our gaze to a hill outside Jerusalem, to an imperial weapon of torture and death, and calls us to see beyond the very worst toward the very best. As the scholars of the SALT Project write, viewed this way, the cross epitomizes and proclaims the great reversal now underway. God is turning the world around, redeeming even the worst of the worst, swords into plowshares, serpents into salves, crosses into trees of life, making all things new. That's the kind of love that gets us through. That's the kind of love that heals. That's the kind of good news gospel power that got my wife out of bed one week after surgery with the help of a church deacon and a borrowed walker so she could feel the sun on her face, ease her way down the path into the greenhouse and start planting seeds again. For God walked among us in human form, not to let us flounder in our pain or judge our failings. Praise God, for we'd all be condemned in that court. God walked among us in human form, sharing our wilderness temptations, keeping us company along the way, past signs that are weathered and faded and blurry, meeting us at the threshold of our anger bitterness, and exhaustion. Jesus Christ came not to judge, but to save us all. Thanks be to God.
hear these words of benediction. God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, God who has brought us thus far on the way. May God in mercy and might lead you into the light on the path to the cross and the resurrection day. Lift up your heads, walk with Jesus, and go in peace. Thank mm -hmm. you.